Hello, everyone, and good morning. Welcome to This Week in Hospitality Marketing, live show number 312. With me, before me, really, if you really want to tend to think about it, because I didn't have my camera on first, Ms. Adele Gutman with AdeleGutman.com, and Mr. Dean Schmidt with Basecamp Meta, which, by the way, where's the floral, happy, bright Dean's here shirt? So, you know, the, the irony <laughs> of that is actually I've, I've got it over here on a cat tower that you don't see next to me. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. my cat decided to use that particular spot this morning, and so now it's full of cat hair. Okay. <laughs> I thought you were being punny when you said uh, irony of it is like, oh, it's not iron. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been much better. <laughs> oh, you know, I give you some, the, the credits there, though. I think I think you're on a roll with it. I think you're in the right direction with it. Um, since you had brought it up at the beginning of Adele, please tell us what you just did. And also make sure we share this so people understand where they can find it. Oh, you mean uh, Kerry, uh, the wonderful guy that we spoke to about cybersecurity. Uh, I, I was so fascinated by that conversation and I think it is so important right now. I mean, look, every night on the news, I'm hearing more about ransomware and how the government is trying to get involved to uh, provide some security for us, especially for our um, infrastructure. Because, I mean, I've seen that um, ransomware and, and cyber attacks are up 30 times. This is a very big uh, crisis for us. And we can't expect the government to do everything for us. We've got to take control of our own destiny at our businesses, at our hotels. So we have to break the knowledge silos. And even though it's the Hospitality Sales and Marketing uh, Association International, I, I wanted to be able to share information about habits that we need to start making and changes we need to start making. So I invited Carrie uh, as well as Marat Sonmez and um, Max Spangler, who is from Charlestown Hotels, uh, a, a really fantastic uh, hotel group here in our area. Uh, he's in the I IT department, I believe. And he... Um, he oversees that for that that uh, collection of hotels. So uh, we had a wonderful panel discussing how we need to change our behavior. And so if you are, uh, please visit my LinkedIn page and you will see uh, that I shared uh, on video that I don't normally share on video uh, our HSMA meetings, but I just felt like it was such an important topic and everybody needs to learn it. We've got to break those knowledge silos. Everybody needs to be part of the solution. Because as Carrie says, uh, you're only as safe as your weakest link. If if there's anybody on your team, even housekeepers, bellmen, uh, front desk people, everybody needs to be on board safety first when it comes to cybersecurity. I'm and you may think that it has nothing to do with reputation, but actually what could be more damaging to your reputation than, um, than losing the trust of your customers because you didn't protect their data? Mm -hmm. Or forbid, we've seen those articles that come out of a major security breach with pick your favorite company. It doesn't matter. They've all, you know, a lot of They've them. All done. It. And boy, what a PR nightmare that is. Yes. Yes. So, uh, yeah, so I, I hope everybody will take the time. Actually, why don't I just put a link in there? Yeah, just put a link in the <laughs> chat room. Or should we give for that? Um, okay, cool. Well, yes, thank you. That's all. It, and it is a very timely conversation. If not before, definitely by now, because it's turned into the point now where, uh, even just personal experience, where we're you're getting notification from some entity you do business with. Uh, uh, we have been found out that we had a breach of security. Blah blah blah. We're looking into it now. Uh, don't worry, everything's fine. And I'm thinking they're going, well, really? And that's why you're sending me this email or this, you know, this letter. Uh, we're looking to see if there might have been some data breaching. We'll reach out to the individual people uh, if we felt that their uh, information was compromised. And you're sitting there going, okay, great. And now people wonder why I don't share a lot of my information when people sign up for, or have signed up for stuff or, or I'm, I'm, I'm making an account with something. It's like, well, we need that information. No, you don't. Well, in order for us to process it, no, you don't. And and it really is amazing. You're to argue with somebody and say, well, we can't, we can't do business with you if you don't give us that information. Then I guess we're not doing business because honestly, you haven't told me how you handle my confidential information correctly. And 
Uh, I'm even dealing with uh, conversations with platforms where this goes into a larger discussion more on Dean's side of the topic, where data is being extracted for tracking for the method of conversions and monies and so forth. And they're blanketly getting a massive amount of data because it's easy and convenient. Rather than giving a, a very long, intimidating script or something, they're given a short script. But in that short script, it literally says everything that this is attached to, we have access to. And a lot of times, as I find out very much so, when it comes to contracts, they don't need all the data. Plus, also, there's no information about them and how they secure the data. And since we're now in that world of GDPR and CCPA, and even as simple as can spam, not to say simple, that was one of the originators, um, the, 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 the companies don't follow up with, well, we are in security of this, and this is our protocols, and this is the link to our guides for uh, compliance for GDPR. They just think that we're going to blindly put script on, and the sad part is we do. A lot of companies, and then, and Dean can test this because we've had fun discussions about this, they get left behind even if you're not doing business with the, with the, the company anymore. A lot of companies go and say, oh, we'll offer this free trial. We need this script put in. You put it in, they get, or they have it put in, I would say. And then the trial doesn't work or whatever, and it's left in. But the company's still pulling data. And yeah. it, it's amazing how often, I, I would say it's more the norm than it is the exception that I find that perpetually with any client relationship I first start with. We do our own audit um, accesses, people's accesses to accounts. They never get taken away. You know, it's like, well, who's this person? Oh, they used to work with us. Really? Well, they still have access. You know, uh, it's it's mind numbing. Or in worst cases, even that person is the administrator and the people that are still there aren't even in control of the account. You have to go chase the person down to get the authentication moved over so that they're no longer the person in charge. Um, years, years ago, speaking to that, uh, I was working, you know what I'm talking about here, but uh, speaking, I work with a software as a service company. And people would ask me, okay, how many logins can I set up with this application? And my answer to them would be as many as you can manage. Right. Because the, technically, the, I could set up all of it. It's unlimited. It didn't matter. But I'd say as many as you can manage because all too often I would see these cases where I would look down the list of pat logins and passwords for an account. And some of those people hadn't been there in three years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. And, and I would even say that, and this is just a word of, 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 Advice, if anything, uh, sometimes in the, the eagerness of a, a vendor to be general with their client, the, the, the owner or the CEO, or the CFO or the president or somebody says, well, just put my email on it. And the, the vendor will be like, oh, OK. And then when it comes time, they don't even know they have access to the account. And if they did, they have long since forgotten what that credentials were required for. And now the company is faced with the how do we get back into this account? And, you know, nobody wants to go to the president and say, gee, can you remember your password? You know, and then it's like, can you go into the emails and find it? It is always, and this is the advice part, good to create an email account that is the super key account that is kept in storage in a vault and a volcano. You know, so equation. Equation here, you know <laughs> uh, that that is the key. So no matter who sits in what chair in an organization, if it comes to the necessity of going in to any account that's an asset to the company, domain ownership, website hosting, um, email accounts, uh, SaaS programs, whatever, there is always a master key account. It's just that's it, a great idea. Well, it works well. Now, you may think, oh, so, well, if you get that access, you you know, you 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 know control the kingdom. Yes, in a way, but also you also do the very long 20-character uh, encryption key passwords for everything. So even if you have the email, congratulations, you're at the door. It doesn't mean you can get in because everything is – there's no commonality to any password, which is another fall down. Um, that every password is a incredibly long – uh, non-relevant, non-stuff created, auto-generated, multi-character, symbols included, gaps and spaces included, everything you can throw at a kitchen sink, 256 encrypted keyword. And that's the stuff you run with. Because as you pointed out, Adele, everybody in the world, and not that I've ever been victim of ransomware, but I've certainly been victim of uh, being hijacked, accounts being hijacked, because of, um, as I said, this firsthand from Facebook, I had... Uh, an account 
that the uh, ad hoc person I had working with it, he had somebody working with him, all authorized. I knew who was working on the account, but they had an email account left over from a previous employer that was never cleared up by the previous employer. Mm. Strangely, what happened was the hack happened through the previous employer's platform, was able to get into this guy's platform and was able to get into my ad hoc's platform, which got into my platform, which got into my client's platform. I kid you not. You'd think it's like, that's a really long thread, but no, it, it was. And and it's usually automated. I mean, it's not a real person thinking, oh, now I got this. It's like, it's computer going, oh, this opened up. Oh, let's go there. Oh, this opened up. Let's go there. And they literally got into an account that handled money, you know, and it's literally, you're thinking, that, and, and, and when we finally found out the string, well, it says, it's like everybody's apologizing. It was like, yeah, but the damage is done. We got to scratch the whole account off, crash the whole thing, rebuild it completely different so that now this, and I got to make your keys for you because now I can't have it where somebody says, oh, I have access. Yeah, you have limited access to this. No, it's literally, I have to make the keys. I use things like, um, uh, well, I use RoboForm for this. What It's a platform like LastPass and all this other that um, the users don't see the passwords. So they just see little dot, 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 dots. And I can control who and when has access. And I've gotten to the point now where instead of just turning it on for them to have access to the client, it's off until they need to They go over and ping me and say, hey, Lauren, I need to get access to XYZ. And I'll go in and I'll turn it on for them to have access. And they're to tell me when they're done doing what they're doing, I turn it back off. And I mean, I we had this discussion on a previous show. I pay cyber insurance. It ain't cheap. And it is dramatically escalated. There was a thing on the news just a few weeks ago four weeks ago, actually, about a month. Um, cybersecurity insurance is a $48 billion and growing industry. Wow. Insurance, just the premiums. Wow. And I can believe it because I went through the process. I was winding on the live show, I think, a month ago. <laughs> I was going through the review of it because my insurance went up a third. And uh, I went to go research comparisons. And it used to be, I would say, they'd say, do you have a protocol for password handling? Yes, check the box. That's what you used to be able to do. Now it's like, oh, great. Can uh, send a copy and give us an example when you realized updated it. I'm um, so what? <laughs> you know, it's like they're not just letting you check a box saying you do these things. You need to show, validate, and follow. Do you have a protocol for that? Great. When was the last time you tested it? And can give us the results. Whoa. They're very much about, okay, it's one thing to have insurance, another thing to actually do the stuff to prevent you from having to use the insurance. So it was pretty thorough. It was, it was, um, it was a lot of work to get through the insurance bank. And no, I didn't save any money. It literally was, if I want the insurance, I had to pay the extra money. And there was nobody that, that was cheaper and the coverage and so forth and so on. It, it, uh, but it's one of those things that now, well, I've always had it. When I could talk to clients, some companies, as you know, Dean, you know, larger companies especially, they can't do business with you because part of the protocol of assignment is to the vendor is that you have to have liability binders, performance binders that are in the millions of dollars. They'd love to do business with you, but unless you have insurance that covers the protocols that they require, you can't do business with them yeah, because you have to have that insurance. A couple of years ago, actually, we were working with a, a contract for a mega casino resort in Las Vegas. And boy, you want to talk about an organization that is obsessive about data protection and protecting that information. And yeah, you exactly what you said. The number of hurdles we had to jump over and insurance that we had to have covered and uh, data protections and all of these things was just incredible. I mm -hmm. hadn't seen ever anyone anywhere else. Had never seen a Marriott do that or a Hilton mm -hmm. do that or anything. Those guys in Vegas, yeah, they were on it. And even at that rate, we've still heard stories about mega casino resorts in Vegas getting hacked. So you're mm -hmm. talking about people that have dotted their I's, crossed their T's, and they still got hacked. Well, um, I, my, his name popped out of my head as soon as I was going to give this story. The gentleman that grabbed every management for MGM, and, uh, well, the Venetian, the Venetian at the time, um, he was talking about the fact that they got hacked one time through the fish tank. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Remember that? Where um, they had an auto feeder on the fish tank. So, you know, the big, huge fish tank, and they had an auto feeder, which happened to be connected via Wi-Fi to keep track of the feeding cycles on the back of the house systems. But it was not as secure as all the other systems you just mentioned, and the hackers were able to get through it. The fish tank! I mean, it's like, yeah, it, it's, not, it's yeah. like water. It's not a matter of if it will go over and find its way. It's a matter of when and how. 
And that's what hackers are like. It's a constant barrage of these efforts of these people to get through the protocols associated with stuff. So, you know, last, last fall, there was a TV series that I recorded on my DVR and never watched until just recently. I'm on, on, on episode four. So if anybody has heard of this, no spoilers, okay? But it, it's a TV series called Next. And the whole premise of it was this guy developed an AI uh, that then went out and became a rogue AI, kind of like a whole Terminator thing, but it hadn't developed the robots yet, right? So, but, so it's taking over the computer systems of the world and all that kind of stuff. But it's really based on what's going on today, what we see in society today. Hmm. And boy, I don't know how this show didn't make it to a second season and didn't creep out a whole bunch of people. Because the stuff that you see on it, you watch this and you're like, oh my gosh, that could actually happen. Mm. <laughs> I mean, it's really freaky. And actually, then the really scary part about it is, of course, this is right during COVID. It was you know, last year, last fall, 2020. Uh, but it gave examples of some things that happened after the fall of 2020. And I'm not going to give away any spoilers, but some things that happened earlier this year after the show was written. And mm. I'm like, oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> so if if you have it's on demand, I'm sure on one of whatever channel it's on, uh, watch it. It's scary. <laughs> you scary know, real. I I I can't even remember the um, the writer at the New York Times name who has the podcast that we talked about in last week's episode, uh, where where. Um, you know, Robert Cole had suggested it on his on his emails talking about AI. And and I said, remember, I said the last 15 minutes of the conversation psh, blew mm. my mind. Yeah. It's because they were talking about um, that that this general uh, artificial intelligence, not specific where you're just learning how to answer specific questions, but just general learning includes a lot of emotional learning. And the reason this, and in the conversation, people were saying uh, that they didn't want that to happen because it's just going to um, include suffering, that the AI is actually suffering. There is no way to have that human element of right or wrong or what should be or should not be or things that should be avoided without giving it some level of suffering. And just looking at the way uh, the cruelty that exists in the universe regarding the way we treat animals who have no voice, this is going to be far, far less. But for 15 minutes, they were talking about suffering. They were not kidding. And mm. they and they were agreeing yet that this is a real thing. And um, as a vegetarian, it was very upsetting for me. Mm. I'm sorry, but I just can't. I, I mean, I, 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 I keep talking about we should have this technology tools so that to ease the lives of, of people, so that they can spend their time doing important creative uh, work that really requires the, the, the human emotional intellect. And, um, and I, I don't want to hear that we're giving that machine thing something to do that's going to cause it suffering. <laughs> I know mm. everybody thinks I need to go to a psycho ward now, but mm. I'm telling you, that's what the podcast was about. No, I would. Um, <laughs> twisting this to two things for marketing, just to say for good thing, because because you bring up the year ago, and unfortunately, we're talking about that more in the news now than we ever have, because a year ago, we're, we're facing the same pandemic numbers in the hospitals that yes, we are now. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and last year at this time was the time when we were coming off of what we all thought was a lull. Like, oh, light at the end of the tunnel. We're going, and we had this uh, false start of uh, emergence. Like, okay, we're going to go back to doing what we're doing. And, uh, you know, it created even worse scenarios. And here we are facing this now um, <laughs> and doing the same thing, only yes. Uh, and, and I'm not going to politicize this or try to yeah. be polar about it, but I think at this point we all have to, for those that look at the common sense thing going seriously, you know, um, they're, they're, you, you have to take it responsible for your own health. And, and 
And at, at the very least, out of us as a society, take the responsibility of how you affect other people's health. Just that, you know, I applaud restaurants in New York that put signs on the door that say no vaccine, no service. I'm with you. I'm totally with you. If I had a service that required people to walk in the door, I'd be slapping a sticker on my door saying, too, you ain't got a vaccine, you can come in. And I love what the guy said. He said, well, how are you going to check? I'm going to ask him for the card. I wonder if they don't have the card. If they don't have the service. It's just like it's just like an underage drinker. It's like if you can't show me your ID, I can't serve you. It's the way it is. You can't show me that you got the vaccines, don't, don't come in the restaurant. I think what we're getting is that that I don't want people to get mad. There are already enough mad people. There's already enough angry people. There's already enough violence going on more so than it ever should be. But I think what's happening now is the quiet, well, you know, let's do what we can. We're getting to this point where people are getting very frustrated with those people that are still walking around, I ain't getting no vaccine. Okay, you know what? Then we're not gonna have business with you or whatever it is. Because we're still, it's strange how it's crept into our daily dialogue. Uh, there's there's shortages of things, persistent shortages of things. Um, there's a thing that was in the local news here for restaurants. A lot of restaurants now on their menus are putting market price. Uh, and it was a pushback on the the feedback, Adele. Uh, the, the 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 reviews of places where it's like, well, this place went all full market price, uh, and mm -hmm. the dialogue went around it is because, and I understand the perspective from the restaurant. Look, our prices are escalating perpetually, and we often don't know when we're going to have certain products in. So all we can do is say, if we have it, and at whatever price we paid for it, we'll have to quote you what we're willing to charge for it. Now, is it a strong marketing statement? Absolutely not. It's a terrible thing to say. But there's a certain reality to this. Like, look, if I have ground beef, then I can make you a burger. Problem is, the, bar the ground beef caught me, cost me three times more than it normally does, so I can't charge what I used to charge. I can tell you what the price is today. And that's what's killing, like, five guys. It's making the news actually nationally. Right. Five guys, $14 burgers. People are like, are you insane? It's like, well, honestly, I'm not applauding them for doing it. But it's the reality of what they have to deal with. Like, okay, we're a burger joint, which means we need a lot of ground beef. And if the price is four times more than what it was, then guess what happens to our price? It goes up. And none of our other costs are going down. As a matter of fact, when you start adding the labor requirement costs, which is well long overdue, I'm not complaining about them paying more people. They should be have already done that. So that's a self-inflicted pain already that they have to deal with. But all these other things are going on. Yeah, it's going to be that unless you want to grab buy your own ground beef and cook your own burgers at home, which you know, or get an impossible burger. Which oh, oh, okay, in. okay, Miss Vegan, okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the 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 whole process of this, from a marketing perspective, is becoming more challenging because going to a lot of what adult advocates and so forth is you are dealing with mediocre to below average service on average. Uh, for a lot of places, or they're deteriorating their their uh, uh, their culture by the reviews that they're getting because of the inability to keep up consistency with their service. Now you're adding these pain points of pricing or the lack of ability to price and the costs associated with it. I really truly see see that we're seeing a uh, an episodic level of change in our food aspect of our industry. I uh, there, there's. Uh, a lot of restaurants that are going the way of fast foods, where it's like, we're just not going to try to do indoor seating. It just, we, we are, we're going that it's really driving ghost kitchens and delivery and pickup services uh, to minimize overhead costs of maintaining facilities for dining. Um, and then to that end, a lot of fast food places, there are McDonald's uh, in Hawaii. We talked about this just about last week where they're running out of food. And so it's usually now a rush to get to McDonald's in the morning to buy food for you to eat later in the afternoon so that you don't run out by the time you need to eat it in the afternoon because they don't have any. Uh, just it, it, as, as it, the U.S. is not used to this. Lots of countries around the world, this is daily life, as long with power going on and off during the day and everything else. Um, so it's, it's one of those things that as an industry, we're hitting it from the food side that way. But the hotels, as we've talked about before, we're maximizing rates and the tolerance of it is, well, I want to get there anyway, so I got to pay whatever they're asking. But now we're coming into this nether edition of our uh, you know, self-inflicted uh, pandemic response that we're dealing with. And we're getting in the news here in Florida, at least, that hotels are reporting cancellations. Yes. And, you know, it, it's, 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 it, it's like, OK, so now what? Because... We just talked about last week that marketing and the and the money spent towards marketing is at an all-time low. 
mathematically for our industry. It is just people aren't spending. It's it's less than half of what they used to spend in marketing prior to COVID. And so marketing, as we've talked about, I've mentioned is, is, is that uh, it's not in the front of people's minds. I mean, there are, they're in the logistics world. They're handling the business that's at their front door, the line at the door, whatever. Um, but when that goes away, which I'm not, fingers crossed, I'm saying it doesn't, but it, if it does, if that's the reaction of our society to stop this traveling process, um, what, what do we do? We do what do we market? Yeah, do I don't we, know. I, I definitely, though, see marketing just from my perspective as a former VP of sales, marketing and revenue for a collection. I, I see marketing not only as advertising, paid advertising. I see it as communication. And right now we need a lot of communication. So what we're, what energy we're not, what we're energy we're not spending on this, we still need to be doing all of this because uh, the lack of communication is causing a lot of the uh, rifts and friction between customers and businesses. I, I think where some of the hesitancy, hesitancy, hesitancy comes in, as Lauren was saying, that everybody, okay, we've had a great summer, right? That leisure, revenge, travel, all that stuff. And like Lauren was saying, everybody is really reaping the benefits of that right now. But they're looking at what happens Q3, Q4, and even into Q1. And they're seeing a lot of these things going on right now that make them worry, are we going to fall off the edge of a cliff? So if business continues as normal, then yes, of course I want to do marketing and I want to think ahead to that time period. If business is going to fall off a cliff, thus making all of that marketing that I am doing for that time period completely irrelevant, gosh, I don't know. Do I want to spend my money on that? Right. right. I understand. And that, yeah, and that and that's the the, the the scary part of this is that from last year, if we're just looking, you know, history not to repeat itself, but unfortunately it does. Um, there was a lot of companies that saved money from the initial impact of COVID by shuttering down, furloughing, and all the things that we, you know, look at and go, wow, that was painful. Um, and then they tried to reopen thinking that the business was returning. And they spent monies towards that. They spent the money that they had coffered and said, okay, let's go do this. And then it all started and that, that money just basically was burnt. It was gone. I mean, how many, did we, not too long ago, how many restaurants opened and were told to shutter and the food rotted or it was, had to be given away? Not to mention they so spent, many restaurants, you know? not to mention they spent a lot of money doing those outdoor seating areas. Right. And, and I mean, there was a lot of things that people spent money on that just, just, then they had to get told to be closed. New York was one of those, okay, this, and no, not this. And then it was, you know, and I'm not picking on New York. I mean, I think they're very responsive in lots of ways with what they're doing. It just, it's one of these things where a lot of companies were, okay, down here, you know, oh, you can serve. Now you can't serve. Oh, God. You know, yeah, I just or, inventory, you know. Or you can have, um, you can sit indoors uh, without a mask on the weekdays, but not on the weekends. Yeah, just weird. That's a real, that was a real rule somewhere. Yeah. I, I know know it is. At least all of that is difficult. Yeah. So, you know, Right now, if talking with clients and to say what to plan for, honestly, realistically, what I'm getting from current clients are uh, today is the day. Do what we have to do today to what we have as demand today. They're very self-inflicted, short-sighted in that sense. I'm not saying the negative. I'm saying that the reality for them is I'm not ignoring future tense, but there's too much uncertainty to see which way it goes. As, as Tim Peter likes to quote, he doesn't forecast. You know, I'm like, OK. And then we, we've had round and round conversations about that. But he doesn't try to forecast in the sense of preconceive where it's going to go. He will plan and prepare for variations in his mind. A yeah. different, yeah. you know, where it's like, OK, if it goes far this way or far that way, this is what I think I'll do. But to say, where do I think it's going to be? He doesn't do that. And I applaud that because I don't want. What, what unfortunately happens is we're faced with two types of personalities when those things happen. Those people that look for everything to justify their perspective, and then a very few people that try to find all the reasons why they might be wrong. Unfortunately, the majority of people are in the first category of once I decided what I think the world's going to be like three months from now, then everything that denies that, I ignore. Everything that supports it, I accept. It's, you know, it's that and kind of... 
And that's in spite of the fact that you're probably wrong. Right. <laughs> no right. matter how much of an expert you are or think you are, it's kind of like the, the, the problem with an average is that it's never right. right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so chances are you missed. Yeah. Well, or if you're a football fan, you're not Patrick Mahomes that can throw to the left where you're looking to the right. This doesn't work. <laughs> yeah. um, so with all that in mind, I, I my, my aspect of conversations I'm having currently with clients is, I understand that we need to do what we have the demand for now. Got it. Um, but, and this goes back to variabilities of predication, let's start putting a spectrum of response, kind of like a color coding of, you know, this side to that side. If we ran out of money by this point, demand wise, what are our priorities? What are the, your priorities really in the sense of sustainability? Like, do you start furloughing people again, even though you've been desperately hunting for them? Or do you maintain their relationship with you? Tell me yes or no on this one, you know? Um, do you keep open in this process or do you close if you are given the choice? I mean, obviously some places, as we know, just tell people company-wise you're shut down, okay? But if you have the choice, are you going to continue to try to do business in whatever form they're allowing you to do? Or you just sort of say, based on your historical experience this past year and a half, almost two years, <clears throat> that you say, you know what, if this happens to this point, we're just closing the doors. It, it, we learn from our lessons. It's better to just shudder and hold on to what we got than it is to continue to try to do business. If you mean, it's better to do these decisions now. It's kind of like a, a conversation I'm having with my wife right now. Our air conditioner is fine at our condo. It's a freaking 105 degrees down here and humidity of 98%. Thank you. But our condition is running fine, but it's also, you know, plus 10 years old. So with our experience of our, uh, you know, it's like, well, you know, let's before it dies on a Sunday in the morning, you know, um, let's go over and find out what it really be to replace it with a new system. You know, let's just, you know, let's find somebody. And so we're going through the process now of finding somebody that will replace our air conditioner. And, you know, these guys come in with the, so what's wrong? It's like, nothing's wrong. We want to know what we do to make it the new place. You know what, you know, with three, and, and they kind of look at us like we have three years. It's like, they don't really have these calls very often of people trying to predicate the problem. It's like, so your conditioner is fine. Yeah. Yeah. It's fine. Yeah. No, it's, it's old, but we, you know, is, is it good that we have the square ducts? Should we have the round ducts? Should we have an extra duct? Should we have an extra intake? You know, all these things. Cause when we bought the place, it had the air conditioner already in it. So for us, it's like, okay, we inherited it. Everything's been great. Your conditioner is fine, but we just want to pray. That's kind of the mentality I'm trying to take on in our conversation now is like, okay, everything's fine. Okay. we got all this crazy business. Yeah. We have all the problems with labor and all we have this, 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 but business is coming in. Okay. What should we do if it isn't again? Well, I, I think efficiency is really important. And I think a lot of times we have to look, we've always just done things this way and it always just worked out at the end, just fine. But, um, just like a retailer may have, um, you know, products that have a really high margin and products that are more of that, that are, have a very low margin and, but they're taking up your time and your busyness and your, your, uh, your, your, ser your service people, whatever it is, your resources, it's eating into your resources try to just uh, determine uh, what really works and what is not necessary because maybe you can just chip away at certain hours that are unproductive and keep the hours that are productive because I think it's better to consistently have open at, at some point where it's not, you're not overtaxing your employees, but they're still coming in uh, and, and you're, you're meeting the need where the need is and, mm. uh, and, and, and maybe taking off things uh, that are, are too expensive or uh, scarce to find and, and, you know, maybe pare it down to things that are, that are really, um, Get, that will keep you alive uh, because it's better to it's better to try and t stay open because things could turn at any time and mm -hmm. and and you're not going to want to start from the beginning again. I think that that if anything now, I, excellent advice by the way. I completely agree with you, and I think that I, I kind of consider like an umbrella. But if you're the one that was 
lucky enough or thoughtful enough or preemptive enough to have an umbrella when it started raining when nobody else had their umbrella. Um, uh, you know, and you walk up to a grocery store and everybody's hungry under the portico waiting for the rain to stop because they didn't walk in with an umbrella. Oh, and here I thought you were just the guy on the grassy knoll in Dallas that one day. Okay, well, well, I was that too. Yes, <laughs> that, the umbrella that you never get. Yeah, um, you know, sharing that 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 with somebody is is a very positive thing in the sense that okay, so we have restaurants that are struggling, and and I'm having owned restaurants and dealt with square footage, space requirements, lease requirements, equipment requirements, and everything else. Um, uh, from conversations we have on Clubhouse, there's lots of ways to buy better equipment that don't require massive hoods and so forth, which is one of the largest, if not the largest, other than coolers expenses associated with restaurants putting into some a space. But mm -hmm. collaborating with hotels that are sitting here, and, and no deference to hotels that are not getting back their group business quite yet, but they have some big monster butt kitchens in the back that are just mostly quiet. And, there's a, and they already have all the equipment that you would need. So making some sort of relationships that said, hey, I got an idea. Why don't you bring your restaurant in house with us? Okay. One is from a cost effectiveness, the hotel is no longer obligated to the maintenance and running of that as a, a department of cost. Uh, it's a turns into a lease. It's just a pure profit run for them. Uh, I wouldn't say pure, but profit run. Um, the restaurant has a home that they don't have to invest into all the things that they would normally run with. And then you start adapting looking at like, so what can we do to take our product of the restaurant and bring it to market? Well, we have a delivery dock in the back of the hotel. Huh, maybe that's a great place for pickup for delivery services. And we have some space in the front so we can offer cuisine to limited seating. A banquet room is a great space out room. I know it's not super luxurious or anything like this, but it can prove to be some sort of functional value to this. Um, you know, the adaptive ways of looking at this that maybe restaurants, and I'm not trying to say that they should shutter their independent business and, and do this, but from a survivability of, of, you know, from a Maslow's hierarchy perspective of whether you live or die based on the next level of decision you have, uh, this might be a sustainable way of existing. We've talked about food trucks. We've talked about the variability that food trucks can offer, the mobility of the kitchens and so forth and so on. Um, who, it, 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 you're not trying to make a bulletproof. Nobody wants to keep driving around in an armored car thinking it's the safest thing to drive. Some, like, you, know, you want to have a convertible too. You want to have the stylish thing. But right now, I think probably the armored car idea is a little safer rather than not having a car at all. Um, having that kind of bulletproof perspective of, what can I do to survive this stuff? And and there's a lot of options that I don't think people have really gotten to think about as much as they possibly could. Some people are really creative. Um, Craig Poole, who I've mentioned before, uh, is the he's the pre president of Reading Hospitality. He's also the general manager of the um, Double Tree Suites or, or Double Tree Hotel in uh, in Reading, Pennsylvania, and uh, they bought some catering uh, businesses that were struggling in their area, in, in, including a, a kosher caterer or a regular caterer, whatever. And they, they brought in those people and they had trucks, which they needed because now they wanted to, instead of having things indoors at the hotels, mm -hmm. they wanted to be able to shift the events that they had on the books to maybe some outdoor places uh, and, or, and or going to different areas, finding other solutions so that they didn't have to cancel those events. Mm -hmm. They could keep those events. And now actually they've expanded mm -hmm. the space where they can create events. They also created mini event rooms out of their suites uh, so that a family uh, could, could have a, a dinner just for a small group, but have the waiter service and everything. And this elevated the service of the catering and it expanded uh, the abilities to say yes to business for the, um, for the hotel. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and on, on top of that, another really creative thing that they did was um, they, they, they wanted to say, ch uh, do something in their restaurant that would attract uh, the, the servers. How are we going to get great servers that really want to be here more than any other thing, not, not be in some other industry? And so they, they looked at a university that had um, arts and, uh, and, and a music school, and the people would come and now... Uh, they got a lot of employees 
who are uh, music students, who were singers, and they are having an opportunity to sing or play their instrument for uh, the for the uh, guests in the hotel and also learn hospitality and service. So they're having a job that makes them money and gives them an opportunity to to um, have that artistic expression, to get practice doing their craft and, uh, and, and gives them something on their resume to build on in the future, whether they stay in hospitality or, or stay in, in um, performing arts. Mm -hmm. And you know that performing arts people are the best hospitality people, by the way. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> a couple of things first off to say hi to Stephanie who's in the, the the chat room with us as well and a reminder to Alan that he's not reading my chat things Alan I sent you a little ping uh, I'm inviting you to go over and be a guest co-host on the sales podcast so you know, I'll, re I'll send you an obnoxious email later about the same thing we're beginning to rotate sales guests for and for this is an invitation to everyone actually sales professional watch especially um, we're beginning to rotate about the new concept for our sales podcast is having guest hosts where they will be the host for the sales podcast. Uh, and uh, I am, I am. Thank you. I would be like, okay, thank you, Alan. Lisa. I wasn't sure if you were reading it or not. Uh, but the uh, guest co-host on the sales, because there's an incredible pool of talent that uh, we have the privilege of joining us with on the show for a variety of reasons. And the sales one is just one of those ones that I think we need to start amplifying a little bit more about. Uh, and I know that I'll take guest hosts for the marketing side, obviously, always. Um, Dean's a little selfish on the meta search, so he doesn't invite anybody, just so you know. But, you know, should you feel inclined, I'm sure if you go up and bring a basket of fruit, bring it up to the volcano, throw it in, maybe Dean will let you join him on his meta search podcast. Hey. Dean invited me. <laughs> that's right. Oh, I did invite okay. Adele. <laughs> uh, okay, somebody's playing favorites, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did, um, going to kind of the theme I threw with this, I was going backwards uh, earlier on, and, and you brought it up nicely with the security issues and so forth, that um, I think the danger about security is that even though it's in the news, people are equating it with all the other burdens that they're currently facing, and they're weighing out the, I need labor, or I have cost of product issues, or what have you, and it's not hitting the top of the line until, unfortunately, tragically, as our society seems to be bent on until you're suffering from it, does it really turn into a reality? Um, I have known companies that have been uh, ransomware. It is crippling. I mean, truly crippling uh, to be stuck and incredibly frustrating. You think it's bad that you, you know, you talk about road rage where somebody cuts you off and you're mad at them. That has no scalability to somebody that locked you out of your own business and you can't do business because of it. And, pain to injury, you're spending a tremendous amount of money to get the privilege back. You want to talk about being mad? Oh, there's a whole new level of mad when it comes to that. Uh, and I'm saying that in a polite way, I guess. Um, so doing these things that you mentioned, Adele, towards that is, I think, a more of a party than it's often being given in our industry. And I want to say one caveat, and this is not to brand bash, but we always say, oh, well, Marriott's doing it. Or it's been approved by Marriott. I talked to him the other day. Well, uh, a Marriott, you know, they, the Marriott's doing it. Okay, so, if, you know, back to what your mom used to say, if everybody jumped off the cliff, we defer too much to brands as to uh, their authentication process. I have, and Dean, you have, and I'm, I'm thinking probably in some ways, um, I've gone through the authentication process with Marriott. I'm sorry. They're not exactly the smartest one in the room when we're talking. It really is one of these things of deference. It's you're dealing with a system that if one department said it was okay, then the other department probably just said it was okay because the other department said it was okay. Next thing you know, you've gone through 10 departments. And by the time you get to the 11th, which is the final gatekeeper, well, all these other 10 departments said it was okay. Well, it must be okay. And it really was just one Yahoo in the first department that said, yeah, that sounds about right. And it goes through the whole process. Doesn't mean it actually is a good thing. It just means you got through the hurdles to get to the point where they stamped it and said, oh, yes. And then, of course, you see so many companies, oh, we're approved by Marriott. To do what? I mean, I can tell you right now, I'm approved by Marriott. Don't tell you what it's for, but I can tell you I'm approved by Marriott and Hilton and ISG and all the rest of them. It's, 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 we allow too much credibility to, again, I go back to the three questions that usually get asked by any C-level or conversation I have. And these have always been persistently the same I was in, in, when I was in there. One is, how much does it cost? 
Second one is how much are we going to make from it? And third is who else is doing it? This authentication requirement of other people. Okay. And of course, if you threw big names like, oh, Marriott's already doing it. Oh, well, automatically it's turned from a, huh, huh, to a, oh, okay. Because they think places like Marriott go through this amazing vetting process. No. You know, yes, there are times where you go through and you get stuck in the mud on stuff. We're going, really, you're hung up about what exactly? You know, it, 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 but most of the time, it's really the politics of engaging conversation through a methodology that they've put in to be Marriott approved or to be Hilton approved. Okay, let me step over the little white line here. You know, it's it's not a big hurdle to go over on some things. And I'm not degradating their process. I'm degradating the methodology of a large organization's process. They are just reflective of lots of companies that they've set up uh, SOPs as to how do they approve these decision processes. And their people, as long as they follow the path and check the boxes, are not culpable for the process is end result decision. They, hey, I did what you told me to do. There's a sheet of paper and I'm supposed to ask these five questions and sign off on this. Well, ask the five questions, check the boxes and signed it. And, and the purpose is lost of, did you believe that this was truly what it was? You know, no, you asked the question and they looked at me in the eye and said, this is blue, I swear, even though it's red, you know, okay, they said it was blue. You know, it's, it's one of these things you have to truly self-decide. You, you have to see, it, you know, does it walk like a duck, smell like a duck, sound like a duck? You know, at the end of the day, you're the one that has to make that choice because you're the one that suffers from it. And that's the part that I think a lot of them are, are not realizing is that this, this mea culpa of, hey, I did what you told me to do and shove it across the table isn't the end solution. And that's what a lot of these are doing. Go ahead, Adol, I'm sorry. Don't relegate your decisions to somebody else. You're an intelligent person. You're in the position you are for a reason. And you can think for yourself, what are the questions I need to be asking? What are the risks uh, I, I might incur from doing this? What are the opportunities I might miss if I don't take advantage of it? You know, uh, talk to, to, to references or look at references or reviews, if that's the case. Uh, and, and yeah, make a decision for yourself. People need to have independent thinking and challenge the standards of whatever organization you're in does you know just because it worked great then is it still the right thing to do now mm -hmm. times change needs change opportunities change and uh you know it, it, you if not you on your own you collaborating with your team are the best decision maker it's funny when one way time. Oh, go ahead, Dean. I'm sorry. I'll say, in, in defense to the, the, the Marriott, so the run, by the way, we're not picking on Marriott. It just kind of. Oh, I am. I'm not picking on Marriott. Not at all. Marriott. <laughs> no, yeah, it. <laughs> I, I would love to be Marriott approved but, any day of the week. <laughs> it, it, it goes across any of the major brands, especially, is that they have a challenge is that every process they do has to be easy, number one, because they've got a lot of people that have to use it, and it has to be replicable. So it has to be something that they can put out there almost on autopilot and 6,000 individual properties across the country can all plug in and push a button and make it happen. So they, they've got to develop something at that scale. And that's hard. And so I, I totally respect that. And I, and I get that's why they have, okay, here's the checklist. One, two, three, four, five. This is what we say is the, the format, even though there's this one guy in Boise, Idaho, that number four doesn't apply to him. And there should probably be a number six that does right? So it doesn't account to all of those things. That's also where you see those cases though too, where an individual hotel uh, has the ability to really be customized to, here's exactly what my security, not just security, but everything else, security, marketing, sales, all here's exactly what mine needs to look like, right? And you can be very specific with it. Yeah. I was it made me smile when Adele was talking about this. I remember one client I was first meeting them, discussing what we would have the potential of doing with their organization, and we're walking from my first introduction to him back to his office, and he says, "So you want to date my daughter?" And I'm like, "I'm sorry, what?" <laughs> <laughs> he says, "That's how I treat any vendor that's trying to do business with me. Is if you're trying to date my daughter, we're going to have some conversations, <laughs> you know." <laughs> and it was I like funny it. because. He took ownership of the decisions. He listened to everybody's advice. We, we, were, we were in a room with all of his team. 
And of course, as we all know from going into those rooms, there are those that are the decision maker and then there's those that are the influencers, the people that are relied upon to give the information to the person that has to decide that. Uh, and so because of that, um, you know, you know, you're talking to him through them. Like, who is it that has the knowledge about what I'm talking about that will validate what I'm saying to him or her? I'm just in my instance, it was a him at the time um, as, as to whether or not what I'm saying should be done and how it's to be done is valid in their perspective as, as the authority on the topic that we're dealing with. And those dynamics are there to flip the coin with what you said, Dean. I totally appreciate the the commonality of having to at least come a denominator, consistency, move the mountain for everybody. But that's why they make hundreds of billions of dollars is, you know what? Figure it out. Yeah. If you have a group of hotels that you need a unique perspective on because you have 32 flavors of vanilla ice cream out there for them. And I'm now I'm bashing the hell out of brands when I say this. Okay, Marion has 32 brands. You don't have 32 ones working yet, but some of them work in some ways. But, you know, you have all these diversifications, yet you try to homogenize the process. <clears throat> Doesn't work. You can't homogenize a process that has the diversity that you're trying to create. You're really literally pulling on both ends of a stick. Okay, it's not going to go either way. It's probably just going to break. If you're going to create this diversification of brand identity, you have to create the diversity associated with it in its operational organization compliance. Not everybody. That's kind of almost a sales thing. They're trying to make it simple for themselves because let's be pragmatic. They're saving costs by standardizing their procedures. Mm -hmm. If you get one guy that can do the thing to 10 different variations, it's a lot better than having 10 different guys doing 10 different things. Okay. So yeah. for them to pinnacle up in their tiered, you know, cost of labor thing. One person needs to be multitasking, but standardized in lots of things. Okay. So from that, that's where they get their success. The real reality is that they should truly go over and have different people or at least different procedures related to each individual company. Alan wrote me a freaking book. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we're, we're all gonna have to take a break and bring oh it all right, Why don't you just bring him on screen? Yeah, Alan, what the hell? Can you do? At this Come point, just he just, said, get on screen with us, dude, because I'm trying to give him the grave next to me. Oh, it's all what Alan's doing. Okay. But still, Alan, you want to come up or Steph or Lex or uh, Ariel? I mean, you're all the more than welcome. You know that always. And I should probably should have said that more repetitively. Um, you know, as is always, this is our chance to talk about all things that we're doing marketing wise and so forth and so on. Um, so, yes, but that's my contrivance to what you just said, Dean, was that. Yes, it is hard and struggling to create that commonality of what everyone believes, but that's why they get paid the big bucks, you know, uh, to figure that stuff out. And they're not figuring it out. And I'm still bashing them today because the only thing I've seen of any effort that is even showing up, um, Hotel Center and Images. Okay, what up, Seth? Um, the, is, is the, the uh, Marriott Bonvoy, which amazingly the Marriott Bonvoy signature swiddly M thing looks like a, a W in reverse, you know, it has the MW combination, which I thought was a little creative on their side. Um, but the, the, uh, that's the only thing I've seen. Cause other than that, and Dean, you've heard me whine about this. They're just throwing money at travel ads. That's about all I've really seen them do is throw money at travel ads. Uh, you know, uh, 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 mutual contribution stuff. Oh, drop this in, we'll give an extra 20% value or 50% mm -hmm. value or whatever. I haven't seen any strong initiatives for anybody, for anything other than brand awareness. I mean, please, I'll knock me off the hill on this one. I haven't seen anything. Well, the brand will argue that brand awareness is their job. That is what they do. Their, their, their purpose is to make everybody aware of and familiar with and choosing that brand. It is your job as the individual hotel to sell your property. Yes. Don't disagree. Hey, there's Steph. <laughs> <laughs> He's asking how to get on. I'm like, oh, yeah, let's just click your little camera on and see if that works. How are you? I'm doing well. How are all of you? Great. Thank you. Okay, good. Doing fantastic, actually. Just having fun going through the whole process. So we dragged you up or we you know, <laughs> guilted you into it. I'll take either. I'm not I'm, I'm not proud. I'm just like, hey, we got enough stuff. Um, what were you asking about? You were asking about something. Go ahead. Yeah, but you were talking about a topic, so I don't want to go off topic until yeah, you're ready. Oh, we're, oh, we're fine. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, sounds good. 
so um, recently, all the Google My Business listings at our three properties and all our restaurants and spas and all that fun stuff um, has, I'm taking that on again. And I have some questions because I was looking at um, Google Hotel Center and I noticed that images, you know, there's images under the amenities tab, mm -hmm. restaurants tab, exterior rooms. What I don't quite understand is how the actual images get into those different categories and how do I upload them? Because I'm feeling like you're upload them through Google My Business. And is it just the AI that goes, oh, this looks like it's an amenity. So I'm going to put it in the amenity section. Or do um, I'm seeing that there's these Google Hotel Center accounts because I was trying to get help from Google, but I don't have a hotel center account. I don't know how to get a hotel center account. Nobody in our company knows anything about mm -hmm. these accounts. So I'm just lost. Well, you're not lost. You're, you're part of the masses and uh, Google hotel centers are, they're, they're, they're the preferred way that Google has organized with Marriott, the M. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and Hilton and IC and all the rest of it. it was first produced to them for their interfaces for and Ge Dean I think you were still involved with this back in the day when they first started offering the hotel centric uh, submissions for Google my business I think it goes that mm -hmm. far back uh, you old little dude you uh, <laughs> but <laughs> it, it used to be to what you're familiar with hey load your pictures up here now you can tag your pictures but you are completely right their AI for lack of a better term, is looking at your pictures and assigning them. Uh, that's the only real influence you have other than tagging or identifying the description of the picture when you load from your side of it. To get the hotel interface of it, um, to be honest with you, it you can ask. Uh, uh, Google will decide to whether to take their magic wand and bless you with it or not bless you with it. Uh, they only offer it to organizations they feel are of substantive level of multiplicities to allow you to have the categorizations predefined. So if I want to go, 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 go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. I want to jump in and add to that real quick because here's the other thing too. Here's the real catch of that whole thing is that if you don't put in relevant content and enough of it, and give Google a source for that, Google will go find it elsewhere. And yeah. they're really good at it. Uh, now, they won't necessarily find the content you want them to find. Uh, mm -hmm. they, they pull, in fact, I once had a, a diagram that was developed uh, by, actually, I'll, I'll even call out, a, there's a digital agency called Blue Magnet Interactive. They're based out of Chicago. And this goes back 10 years ago, but they created a diagram of, here's where Google gets all of their stuff from. And it was just a spaghetti bowl of everything everywhere. It was insane. Uh, and even now, 10 to 10 years later, it's still right. Um, that this, however, and, and now, and again, this is to what Lauren was saying, the, the bigger dog in the fight has a little bit more leverage in this and that they can start going in and saying, no, you have to get the data from a single source of truth. And then they start utilizing tools like ice portal or, uh, Leonardo and those things and say, that is my single source of truth. Unfortunately, that's a little more difficult for an individual independent hotel to carry that big stick and say, yeah, this is where you have to get it from. Yeah, I would ask you, do you have a place like that? Do you use Ice Portal? Totally recommend it. Is. Totally recommend it. Um, it is, okay, it's like Dean. Everybody doesn't know what he does, but they're happy that he does it. Uh, <laughs> That's what my wife keeps saying. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Meta search and image centralization are two things that people don't realize how the world functions, but are critical to the conversation. So Ice Portal and Leonardo, and I'm not going to go through the whole history, but Henry Woodman, who owned Ice Portal and sold it to C C C I never said CG. Right. CG, thank you, um, created this database of your images so that you can literally identify, tag, correlate, create, categorize all the cool stuff with your images. It also means, and this goes back to the distribution side, it's a central authority for wholesalers, consortias. Everybody that needed your image graphics had one place they could go to. So when you said, this is the image of my lobby, it was your choice of image. It was the same image used by everybody, not the one from 15 years ago when you had the shag carpet, which by the way, I think he's coming back, just saying. All right, so <laughs> the- and Hopefully the, the order would be the way 
you set it up, at least for, yeah. for Leonardo, for example. Yeah. Leonardo, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit of a negative on the Leonardo people. The concept is there, but Leonardo, I just, I know the politics history of it. So I'm, so I'm never. They, they, ironically, they did it first. Yeah. <laughs> I know. They, 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 they did it better. <laughs> yeah. Henry's a friend of mine. So that's why I'm always biased to Henry, but yeah, Leonardo and so forth, but how they tried to corner the market with monopolizing the contract and stuff always pissed me off. So, the, the platform allows you to do this. And to Dean's point, if you have that kind of centralized base for your image graphics, categorized and tagged and identified correctly and updated and so forth, you can use them in Google. And this is the, I wouldn't say the shortcut, but the, the, the sneaky way of doing this. By using it, Google, as it learns everything, says, oh, you have a place where all this stuff's at. I don't have to go ranking it around everywhere. I can just go to where you say you, you're, where you're already showing me you're pulling the data from. Let me see what else you got. And they'll tap into it because uh, Ice Portal and Leonardo will tell Google they have all this image graphics for you. They'll say, hey, guys, Google. And they have, they're have they a big enough organization that they get Google's attention. Hey, we have all this stuff. So Google will say, oh, let's see what you got. And if Google finds what it needs for what it's trying to fill, next thing you know, you got what you're asking for, which is uh, these are my pictures of the rooms. This is room double. This is room king. This is room suite. Okay. This is restaurant. This is lobby. This is pool. And it's what images you want it to be with the proper tagging and information. The other really cool part about things like Ice Portal and Leonardo is you now get amazing information about who's looking at your imaging where, from how, at what point. And you start correlating that with your search queries, your data from other places, and you get some crazy insights. Because as you know, when you just look at your website, simply images is one of your top five things that they look at. If it's not accommodations, it's image of some sort. So tapping into clarity of that traffic, other than what you already have on your website, is wicked strong. So it's a very, and it's not expensive. The platform usage of, of Leonardo, well, Ice Portal isn't Leonardo. Uh, you know, it's it's probably about seven to eight hundred, seven hundred to a thousand a year, something. I think it, that's the last price I remember from Leonardo, at least. But and another yeah. one I would add into that mix, if, and this is going to go to some old school hospitality people, uh, the Lanyon Property Vault. It's actually still out there. It is kind of still a thing, but that used to be the de facto source that you would go through largely for your travel management companies and the RFPs. And you'd say, here's my data. It, it tells me everything about my hotel. It's got all my content and so forth. It, it's certainly not uh, at the level of an ice portal or anything, but if you want to go backtrack 15, 20 years ago and say, what were they using then? That's what it was. And, and this also helps with your problems where you have a wholesaler that's trying to sell you, but it's pulling an image from some other place than you. And they're showing what you don't want to show anymore. Like you may have gone under a reno or you may have changed your whole profile and they're pulling an old picture. Um, the other really neat part of the images and the information is other than finding out what they're connecting to and how they're connecting, um, you get this ability to resize automatically which is a real huge sublime way of value proposition based on the multiplicities of platforms. Now, instead of it turning into a micro picture on your phone, because that's all that can be pulled in, these platforms auto adjust it So it crops correctly your image on whatever they're looking at. So you always get the best resolution, best sizing, best perspective of the image. So it's, it's really, I'm a huge advocate of, of that photo library functionality. And as much as I bash Leonardo, it still provides a great service. Um, I'm just more leaning onto the ice portal side because Henry's, you know, nice guy. <laughs> I remember how Isn't happy it? I was to discover Leonardo in the beginning. It was feeding my, my booking engine. I could stop having to search the internet to uh, monitor my global, my 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 online presence, and and writing individual companies, uh, not to use that picture from that's too old or we don't have it, we've remodeled everything. It was so difficult before. Um, I think in the end, I was probably paying like three fifty a month since you asked about the price. That was many years ago already. But uh, at at one point, I needed the thing that you could actually make a mini website. 
At one point I really needed it and it was super handy. And then at some point I didn't. And at some point I couldn't uh, have my booking engine taking the pictures from there. I couldn't take uh, Expedia taking the pictures from there. I, I, I had to put the booking, the, the, the pictures on booking.com individually anyway. So it just became less and less and less uh, important to me, but I wasn't, uh, you know, I wasn't looking at whatever you just said, Lauren, about uh, who's lo who's looking the pictures or who's oh the traffic the, the traffic numbers the sourcing the, it was geography and time, which goes to also since you brought up Google My Business, the, the part that nobody seems to use it for is the directions inquiry. It is absolutely awesome data that it'll show you where people were looking to get your driving directions. Like where were they at when they were asking for directions? And it's brutally helpful for drive market, your radiuses of, of region out, also your geo-targeting. Like if you see that they're really asking for driving directions from the airport, you, you, you'd say, well, yeah, duh. Okay, here's the duh part. One is they got to rent a car because they're not looking necessarily for directions all the time because of Uber. People will still look to make sure the Uber person is not driving them out to an open field. But for the most part, it's because they got to rent a car uh, and they're using their own stuff for that. And also directions back and forth from the airport to the, to the, so they have time zones. And if that be the case, for instance, if you get a lot of people, now you can start breaking it down by time based on arrivals to your, to your, and the website usage. You correlate the directions to your website activity as well. And you start seeing who that is and you start segmenting out by business types. Is it a business traveler? Because they look at it for certain reasons for a certain person. How long is it going to take me to get from the airport to the hotel or a vice versa? You know, what are the directions back and forth? You first off can expand your content because of that. Like now, obviously, you know, there's enough traffic demand for it. But also there's a lot of little hub places outside of your city. Like why would a area outside of the suburbs be interested in directions to my hotel? You know, and it might be the restaurant or it might be because family's connected, which means it's your Smurf market. Like, okay, maybe is there a reunion, you know, and then you look at your folio stuff and your group business. Did we do something that was the local high school reunion or did we do something that was the fraternal or something? And you start creating those correlations and saying, well, if that's the case, why can't we target that market in our ad campaigns, you know, with a, with a geocentric marketing campaign? Because likelihood is that they want to do it again and or there's other entities that might want to do it as well because an entity already did. It's just, there's a whole amount, amount of information off of the Google My Business that people don't really tap as hard as they could in some ways. Just me being excited about Google My Business. That's, <laughs> that's, that's really interesting. Um, I was gonna add with regards to Google My Business, and this is something that I think everyone overlooks, is that staff will use the, um, the Maps feature, whether it's Apple Maps mm -hmm. or, Google, or the Google Maps, and they click on it because they want to know, you know, is there an accident on the way? Is this the fastest way for me to get to work today? So literally, you probably have, depending on the size of your hotel, you know, a thousand people every day asking for directions mm -hmm. because they want to know the fastest place to work. And then the other thing that I always recommend is ensuring that you've um, done your UTM uh, parameters on all of your links on Google My Business so that you can see what traffic is actually coming from Google My Business versus mm -hmm. organic. Otherwise, it just dumps it in the organic bucket and that might, might be misleading to you. Very true. Very true. And to that end, that adds to the whole dialogue of ways. Uh, I've actually, it, it, what my clients are suggested, like, you should go make a ways group for your employees, to your point. You know, that way it, it helps them because it was construction. It, it came out of the fact that there was construction around the hotel. So it was a huge divergence around the hotel because of the traffic, which was a positive in the sense that a lot of people that weren't familiar with the restaurant at the hotel, which was the inspiration of the conversation, would become aware of this restaurant. So we wanted to do a ways targeted campaign. It's like, hey, you're driving right by this place. You might want to come in. And it did. It proved very successful for people's awareness of coming into having a restaurant. Like, hey, pull in, have dinner. By the time you're done with dinner, traffic's lighter. Go home, you know, because of the construction. Vice versa, hey, if you need to pick something up on the way in, ta-da, pick it up on the way in. Uh, so we had fun with that. But what we that came out of that also was the employees were not all familiar with that Waze even existed. They're, like you said, familiar with Google Maps, which Waze is owned by Google. Um, so they made a Waze group. And for those unfamiliar with Waze, you can make a group. Uh, for, for, for commuting, where, you know, the group will report into the group the same travel pattern, you know, because it's a group, you know, like, 
if all of us were driving to the same hotel and I'm going in, I'd be like, hey, guys, traffic at the corner of blah, 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 you know, something happened, such and such. Yes, you could see it on the app, but it also notifies my group that this was happening. And so you would automatically know, don't go through that intersection, you know, go the alternate way that you have to go to get around that intersection or something. And the group created a nice little uh, perk for the employees uh, in the sense that they were familiar with their traffic issues, getting in with all this construction that was going on at the time. Just a little weird thing. Just yeah. My husband is always saying that the Google Next is so much more helpful than the, the Apple. Like that, oh, you'll yeah. be like your 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 destination is on the right, and like there is no driveway here, <laughs> there is no road here. Or make a U turn, but it's like oh, is on the right, but you... right here I can just go right in. I don't have to make a U turn. Yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm a little, I'm an Apple freak, as you know. I have Apple everything, but I have always forever been tainted with Apple Maps when they first came out. Story to be told. I went to Munich, and it was Oktoberfest. And Apple Maps came out, and at the time, they wiped off Google Maps off your Apple phone. They wanted to be the map company. You know, okay, it's our phone, our maps. Okay. I walked to Oktoberfest in about 45 minutes from my hotel. Granted, beer was involved, so can't really say there wasn't some other other factors. <laughs> uh, <laughs> four and a half hours to walk back because Apple Map kept wanting me to walk over bridges over a river to back to my hotel that was a road only so i walked through some parks and saw some things that still scarred me mentally for life uh <laughs> but four and a half hours later i made it home <laughs> a lot sober than i started to walk with i gotta tell you that right too so yeah it was uh, so ever since then apple maps have not been my friend i tried and they've gotten a lot better and they're you know but still, you're right. My go-to, if I really want to get an answer, I flip open the Google Maps and go, or wait, if I'm driving somewhere or something, I'll hit Waze up because the response and traffic awareness is way higher in Waze. And I got to say, advertising on Waze is pretty cool too. You put a little balloon pop up for your restaurant and you can offer things and coupons, you show this, you give this or whatever. And it's just a click of, yeah, put, put it in my route and poof, all of a sudden you can pull into the restaurant. And it has proved to be very productive in that sense. So. so um, just to bring this full circle, with Google Hotel Center, you have to be approved by Google to actually be able to use, have a Google Hotel Center account. Is that correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. And how do you contact Google in order to request to be um, ordained with this account? That's one of life's great mysteries. <laughs> the challenge you run into is that everybody you reach out to at Google when you say, yeah, I want help with my AdWords account or my, you know, with this, their mentality is that you're a business other than a hotel because there's a billion other businesses out there, right? And that's normally what they do. And they don't realize that, oh, this hotel thing's a little different and we have mm -hmm. to do this a little differently. And, and it's hard to get your rep out of that. So my advice is find somebody else who's got one, figure out who their rep is and ask them for help. Yeah. You, you know, that you get hit because you run the ad accounts that and it's like, oh, I am your Google ad rep. OK. And it's just one of a thousand people that you're just being tossed around to talk about how much less you should more you should be spending because you're spending less than you should. Right. Um, just bugger the heck out of them. Hey, y'all, I am so glad you called. I need to get this connection to my and, and see how fast they don't call you back. But if you really push them, it's like, you know, just literally bug the bejeebers on them, act like you're interested in what they're having to sell, get their contact information, and then just badger them. At the very and least, they'll say, that's not my department. Great. Then could you connect me over? Hey, how are you doing? How are you wearing? What are you wearing today? What's going on? And you just, <laughs> they're like, I must get rid of this person. And then be like, give me that phone number. You know, that's the only way, because honestly, okay. I have not been successful with a single place to go to that says, oh, if you do this, you'll get this. Even today, because um, I have the TV thing, you know, the TV channel, Apple, I'm having a problem with. And there is the developer side of Apple, and then there's the consumer side of Apple. My problem is on the developer side. Uh, and But the support is only on the Apple side. And they can see my, my case number, but they can't affect it. The woman gets so frustrated with that wall that she says, look, shouldn't be giving this to you, but here's a phone number. <laughs> I'm like, really? That's good. You know, that's yeah. literally took that. I'm like, wow, major corporation, hundreds of billions of dollars. And I got to get a secret phone number. You got the Parker promo. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, do, 
I did see something new from Google yesterday, and it's um, small business advisors for Google products. But I just don't know if the hotel fits into that category um, because, you know, who defines what a small business is other than the SBA? And, you know, according to the SBA, it depends on how much money, how many employees, and depending on your, um, what's that, that special number anyway, that you mm -hmm. fall into that category. So, but they do charge $39.99 per 50 minute session. And um, you can ask anything about Google ads, Google My Business, Google Workspace, and then they have an other bucket. So there was like five things. And then there was the other bucket. And I'm like, hmm, is it worth paying $40 to go to the other bucket? It just might be. It might be just if anything, because yeah. the last thing that they want to play against their own system is to lose a potential growth client. Right. Like, oh, can we get more money for them to spend with us? And if you basically, because as all the systems are built up, would you like to have a survey or review at the end of our conversation? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the more you say, wow, I really wanted to do more, but they never had the solutions I was looking for, or I didn't have the, the, the answers to the question, that just gets ding, 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 you know, that gets pushed up because everybody doesn't want to be the one caught with the bad answers. And, it, you know, sometimes it gets somewhere. Other times they're like, yeah, well, whatever. Can't fix that one, you know. But, yeah, to Dean's point, you know, basket of fruit, top of the volcano. That's because there is and that it's amazing the for the size entity that Google and Facebook are the inability to actually talk to someone. And I, yeah, I understand because of the usability of everybody, billions of people that use their products. There's just no infrastructure that could support a direct communication. But even the communication they provide is there's not even there's not even on the inept scale. It's the non-existent scale. There is no way to reach the top of the mountain. And yeah, I I can say that I have spent hours and hours and hours and hours with, on free conversations with with Google. Uh, resolve you know re resolving issues, asking questions. It. I, I was always actually amazed that they would do that for me. And, but, you know, and for me to spend an hour and a half on a Friday on the phone with Google was <laughs> not an uncommon thing until, mm -hmm. until I felt like I had things sorted enough. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I've never seen them charge $40 or anything like that before. I, I don't know whether, Maybe I was talking to the AdWords people about Google My Business. That's possible because they have to have representatives for uh, something that you're paying for. Uh, but I mean, they were helpful, but like uh, the same with if you're on the phone with Microsoft or uh, anything like that, sometimes those conversations are an hour and a half long. And, and I don't think anything should really take that long, but I guess it's complicated. Um, well, what I was going to add to that is uh, the technical support side is still all free. This is mm -hmm. just a new beta test with more along the lines of strategy. And I think they're looking to be more consultants mm -hmm. um, and, of course, yeah. selling their own products. Right. So it's a loss leader, really, when you mm -hmm. think about the, the price. Uh, so it will be interesting. I agree with you 100 percent, Adele. If you're on chat. For some reason, something that takes five minutes takes an hour and a half to do. And I think it's because they multitask. They'll oh, yes. Yeah. Clients. And they're like, OK, let me send this person a message. Let me send this person a message. And you're like, really? And I always type, are you still there? Mm -hmm. Because I've had it where I've been on with them. And then all of a sudden it says, we're going to shut down your conversation. Right. And I'm like, why? Yeah. I'm uh, here. I'm so wait, yeah. Yeah. It's Maybe. true. No, uh, I was on the phone with them. I would, that was not a chat. That was a, the yeah, real that's human culture. with a voice. Yeah. I, I would say that, that regardless, I mean, I've often gotten good conversations from Google from going through a different door, like, because I have a Google development account, they'll answer that phone. But then it's not what I'm asking about. And then, you know, it's very clear, like, well, that's not anything development. It's like, well, it actually is. I'm trying to put that in as a function, blah, blah, blah. I'll make some BS up. And they're like, well, well, um, we'll need to bring you over to another department. Great. What's the number? No, we'll transfer you. No, no, no. I know you'll transfer me. What's the number you're transferring me to? I have a poor connect. I mean, yeah. you've heard it a thousand times. I'm just flipping the table around going, you know, we might have a poor connection. What's your phone number so we can reach back to you? Okay. So I just flip around going, hey, 
I have a poor connection. Can I get the phone number just in case we get disconnected? Because I hate to restart this over. It's a crapshoot. Sometimes they'll be dumb, not dumb enough, kind enough to go over and tell you. Other times I can't give you that number. Well, if you're transferring, I get lost. How do I have to come back to you then? You know, I, I just, it's the sales technique in reverse. I'm not letting you off the hook until I got the answer. Okay. You know, you want to pawn me off. Like, I'm sorry, but I, I got to talk to my super. Great. You know, who am I talking to so that I can talk to them? You know, it just, you push those things with them. And, and, you know, sometimes I get frustrated, but other times you end up getting a piece of information, like a phone number to a secret department uh, <laughs> that you didn't plan on getting because you just were tenacious enough to bug the medievers out of them. It's sad that you have to be resorting to that, but it's the reality of it because we, we are usually recipients of those efforts. We're usually the ones that are just dogged to, to death about means of wanting to spend more money and such. But I, I love the fact that you're focused on Google My Business because you know, from from even just an additional ads perspective, usability perspective, uh, it kind of lends to our earlier conversations about just how is it going to change the scope of our travel interests as to how we decide things. And I think people are ignoring Google My Business until all of a sudden it's like, wait a minute, most of our business is truly related to an irradiant area or a destination to location uh, kind of correlation. And the map and the business is a key element to that. So. Yeah, I have one more question, um, just because I haven't been uploading the images to Google My Business for our property, uh, but I've noticed that the recommendation is for it to be square. So have you all seen that as well? It's like 720 mm -hmm. pixels by 720? Mm -hmm. um, okay, so I should upload yeah. them all in that size. Okay, I just yeah, wanted well, to make sure. It's, it's the most generic multi-use function. If you 16.9 it, you get automatic crop and it may not be centered crop. Uh, and then if you do uh, vertical, okay, then you get again, wrong centric because it, what most people don't, well, most people, maybe they do. Um, cropping doesn't mean center. It means crop. It means, well, you know, th there are times where it'll crop top, crop bottom, crop side, crop left, crop right. It doesn't really, now this is where places like Google stuff get a little bit better. They'll look at the image and they're looking at density of, of graphic and probably things I have no clue about what they look at, but they're looking for what seems to be the most prominent aspect of the photo, of the photo when they try to analyze the photo. And they'll try to crop corresponding to what they think is the centric value of the image. But if you do proper photography in the sense of quadrants, you know, third, 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 your centric image isn't in the center, it's off center as it should be, especially if you have people in it. And if you crop even centered, you possibly half crop what you want the people to see. So square is the most stable singular one because if they do 16.9, they're just gonna bar it. If they do vertical, it's gonna run it down the line. So likelihood is you're gonna get more average success with a square image than you are with the uh, various uh, sizes and stuff, so yeah. Okay, and I was wondering, um, do you think it's beneficial to put a pro uh, send up an image of a property map on Google My Business? One, I don't know how they would classify it. I'm not in any way. I think yeah, images just doing it as much as you can. Yes, but if they can. And what I mean by property map is just because our properties have lots of buildings where, mm -hmm. you know, like I'm in room 102. Well, where's building 102? One. Like, yeah. where is that? How do I get there? And so a map can be helpful for people or, oh, I didn't know you had shuffleboard courts. Yeah, because you see it on the map, right? Things here, here, like that. Yeah, here's my pro con. Pro is, yes, uh, any visualization that people can understand perspective and location and the information that a map like that provides is powerful. Negative. Now you're asking me to pinch and squeeze. Mm -hmm. uh, I won't be able to see what you're trying to tell me unless I look closer for it you're getting into resolution issues because they standardize resolution. So if they try to get too close, you're not you're not conveying the information you want to convey because room 102 doesn't show up as 102, it's pixel, you know, and, and you can't tell where it is. So it proves to be more of a frustration point than an assistance. From a perspective of, look, we got lots of buildings, okay? And we have lots of locations of stuff. And if this picture isn't helpful, at least you know we have an image like this you should come to our website to get that kind of information to it. Um, I don't think cutting the picture up is helpful because then people don't know how they, the piece of the puzzle goes back together. Uh, so I think 
based on specifically what you're asking for, it's better to do it and to see if it is a value based on tr usage of the image than it is to not have done it and made a decision that you, know, that you don't know whether there was a benefit to it or not. So I just know that when you start doing that kind of high, it's like meeting space breakdowns. Uh, we did that too, where you put the meeting space map on, you know, here's my ballroom, here's my breakout room, so this stuff. You, you had to pinch and look, and it really didn't provide more other than just some perspective overall that there was, you know, variety of locations to it. So more positive than there is negative, but it's not a super big positive, I don't think, in that sense. Okay. I don't so know. Speaking of meetings and weddings, since you brought that up, would you load images of your meeting spaces and wedding spaces to Google My Business? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. absolutely. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I don't see a con to that. <laughs> okay, no. I just want to make sure because I was like, you know, ultimately, do I want to show a meeting space or a room? Well, most of my people that are coming to Google My Business are looking for rooms. They're looking for certain things. They're not looking at a ballroom. Right. So I don't want a ballroom to trump it when you're looking at images. No. And, and it, it, you also, it, it, the way I always try to look at it, weirdly enough, is I'm not filling a lifeboat where I have limited space. They'll take whatever you put in there. Okay. So it's better to have as much as you can. And yes, it may not be that if, if, if the traffic is to your ballroom most often, it's going to be your primary image that's brought up related to them. But here's what you're also helping Google with, which is what you started the original question with. The more you give them, the more they understand you. So the more images of rooms and meeting rooms and conference rooms and even configurations and breakouts, the more stuff you feed them, the more they understand you, the more likely it is that they're going to start categorizing you correctly. Like, oh, that picture is a meeting room. Like, these pictures are meeting rooms. So, you know what? We should put that under meeting rooms. They're going to start doing that kind of stuff compared to just one image, which is, well, that's an image of some area in the hotel, just like that image is an area of the hotel, just like that one. And it doesn't get categorized where you think it has the most benefit, which would have the most benefit, which is under meeting rooms. You know, so giving them more images helps them, uh, educates them in understanding all that you are. Plus, and this goes back to the how everything connects in the world of Google, the more this shows up in Google My Business, the more it reflects on their indexing of your website. Like, oh, that image is of that ballroom that's on your website. Okay, so you do ballrooms, which means you do meeting space. And now all of a sudden you're indexing higher SEO wise related to meeting space because yeah. you've provided them that content correlation. People aren't necessarily go, just going to your Google My Business and then looking at the pictures. They could be Googling weddings in Toronto. And if you have pictures that relate to uh, um, weddings in Toronto, that could be how it comes up. Yeah. Virginia's asking about Google messaging. It is, first off, I'm never negative about new technology, as you all know. I love every shiny object that's out there. Here's my caveat about Google messaging, and I love every all opinion about it too, is it's great if you can do it. If you can't maintain it consistently, I would not do it at all. I would much rather rely upon some sort of bot correlation conversation if you really want that kind of engagement that is autonomously able to be created that then would hierarchy getting to a human, but it answers a lot of basic level one questions then it would be to say, we respond to all of our Google messages. It's just like Facebook Messenger uh, or, or, and Facebook. If you can't maintain response time, let, this, you know, Expedia, do you respond within three to five hours? You know, can, can you maintain that? That's their pinnacle of response. That five-star value is, oh, this place responses in three to five hours from any comment that's made on Expedia. If you can't maintain it, then don't, if, be within 24 hours, but if you're going to be within 24 hours, you got Expedia, TripAdvisor, uh, Google, website, emails. You got a lot of stuff, Messenger, that you got to be watching all of it to say that you are that Pearson. And Google Messages is just like that. It's like it's a useful tool, but you got to be consistent with it because the minute you somebody you're saying that you do it and they you don't answer it, it turns from a positive to a Bigger negative. I don't know. It's amazing how many people don't look. Sometimes I'll see questions that are up for days, yeah. for weeks. They're answered a month later. Yeah. It's very, it, it, it doesn't look good. And, and I love when people post a question about a hotel. Does this hotel, you know, have blah, blah, blah? 
And the answer is, I don't know, but why don't you call the hotel? <laughs> well, and I think I also say, I think there's a difference too between the question and answer and the messenger. And um, I do help out um, a restaurant with regards to their messages. And the notification from Google My Business isn't very good to tell you you even have a message sometimes. Like you have your alert set and it doesn't even tell you. Um, but internally, like for those questions and answers on the Google, uh, the Google My Business listing where you can just ask a question and Yelp has that too, is sometimes our um, firewalls block those messages from coming through. Yep. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. And like Yelp is a perfect example of that. It gets trapped all the time. And then I'm like, oh, did you guys answer this question? And they're like, we didn't even see it. And yeah. it's like two days later, I'm like, you know what, if I want to make a reservation for a restaurant and I want to know if you're doing X, Y, Z, I want that answer within five minutes. Right. And I don't think that messenger, any of these messenger services, people are going to respond that quickly. It's like, go old school, pick up the phone and ask the question if you want to know right now. But, but you know, some people just don't, that that's too invasive on their personal life. They just want to throw the question out there and have somebody answer. It's convenient to them. You can't fight yeah. the ease of technology and, and you can set up things to come in uh, to you by email. You, 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 and, and that's the only way to go. That email goes not only to, you know, the executive office, but it can also go to the front desk. And if you have a 24 hour front desk, you have smart people who are able to answer questions when people come to the desk. They're just as able to answer the questions in writing. You just need to train them. Hey, real quick, guys, I got to jump off here. So everybody have a great weekend. <laughs> Thank you. Bye, I am going to a, a doctor's appointment I have to go to, oh. and I'm moving next week. <laughs> Wait, so whoa, I'm whoa. not sure if I'll be ready by Friday to, to come back, but I'll definitely see you the next week. All right. Very cool. <laughs> now, um, uh, real quick for you guys, just real quick, Dean, people to find oh. you where? Uh, if, if you need to learn about Metasearch or need somebody to do Metasearch for you, Basecamp Meta and MetasearchMarketing.com. Okay. Adele? If you want to learn how to have a great culture at your hotel, uh, great loyalty, if you like keeping your business, not just marketing business so that they come and then they don't come back again, but keeping your customers and having those customers actually attract new customers for you, that's what I call hospitality reputation marketing. I can help you with that. And you can just go to the uh, podcast, uh, the hospitality reputation marketing podcast get great reviews there are some conversations on there that you will learn so much from and uh and i wish everybody uh great reviews and a great week ahead and i will see you when i see you very Bye soon now. thank you www.adelgutman.com uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> bye um, bye now happy moving happy thank moving you. <laughs> Well, Steph, I, I mean, you know, strangely enough, because we are changing the format, we're, we're going to start shortening the show anyway, so it kind of works out really good in this sense. But I mean, obviously, we are. I'm more than happy to keep because I haven't seen you. I haven't talked to you on Clubhouse forever and stuff. So I know. Are you still doing Clubhouse? Because it I'm is, but I've changed the scheduling. Um, oh. Honestly, because of of uh, the TV channel being as busy as it is for me, and the podcast, we have you know all these podcasts running in this show, um, and and not to be bemoaning of it, but it's like my inspiration of doing Pubhouse was to have open dialogue. And it turned out I was beginning to be the only one that talked. Right. And it God happened. knows, I, you already know what's in my head. Uh, and I talked too much anyway, so yeah. <laughs> When um, when are you on Clubhouse? Because I'm not seeing anything, and I've been looking for you yep. and also Edward, who has taken a little bit of a break. And Thank someone you. else contacted me and said, "Hey, what's going on?" And I'm like, "I don't know." <laughs> I'm going to come back on right now, Wednesdays, uh, Mondays, and Wednesdays. Uh, well, that's good. Yeah, yeah Monday, Monday, Wednesdays, uh, and really, it's it's out of the tone of can I get? I look at it as like. A couple of things. I think there were some perfect storm things in a couple of things. One is, uh, well, first off, Ed has taken off. With their business has grown exponentially on their new product. So he's just been sucked into that. Um, and he, he expressed the same thing with us. He's like, we kind of talked through all the things we thought were interesting. And with the way things are going right now, without being the behringer of bad news, like, okay, here we are again, and all this other negative, it's like, look, that and, you know, it's true. Marketing is not on the front burner for a lot of people right now. Uh, they're not thinking about their marketing strategy. They're thinking about their survivability of 
logistics right now, operations, labor, so forth. So as much as we were talking about aspects of marketing, we, I, I felt like we were retreading a lot of stuff. We, it was kind of a conversation in repetition. And it was like, I didn't want to do it for that reason. It's like, I'd just rather pop back in when it's worthy of a new conversation. And so the, the pause, which is now, I think it was about two weeks, uh, is brought back. It's like, okay, some things have changed enough that I think we can come back into it. And, and uh, I looked at it as, you know, some of the people was like, this is a chance for everyone to kind of get back and say, hey, it's good. Let's do talk about it. You know, it's like get back that inspiration of what it was rather than, hey, good to see you again. You know, it's great, but I wanted it to be valuable. So I think that's where I changed the pattern on it uh, a little bit. So, yeah, it did. It was one of those quiet things. But but to that end, you know, marketing is that it's its lowest spend right now historically for our industry. It is the lowest measured expense associated with our industry ever being recorded, which is 40 years back now. Um, so when I even talked with clients, my my supporting role for them is literally helping them with logistic questions, um, communication issues, sustainability issues, and uh, things like changing marketing strategies to recruitment. Like yes. how can marketing help recruitment at this point? Uh, we have HR people that can't even get the job postings on platforms, let alone how do you do it in a way that uh, optimizes being on that platform. So it's really changed a lot in that sense. And also creating uh, variations on strategy for the future. Like, okay, let's look at scenario spectrum and see what we would do based on this parameter, this parameter. Uh, and that's pretty much because uh, uh, spending money, uh, they, they equated too much with spending marketing money now on building more business. And it's not building business now. It's about sustainability of communication business later. That's just a hard ex explanation to people that don't have the time of day a lot of times. So. Yeah, so um, you're going to come back to Clubhouse Mondays yep. and Wednesdays. And at mm -hmm. what time? At the same time, noon. I, I, noon. I know it's a hard time. I know it's a hard time for people, but I think it's also probably one of the more optimistic times because I see there's a lot of people are tra trying to hit the same time. Um, I also, to this point too, I really, even though we were calling it hospitality marketing, I really had opened it up to being hospitality anything in the hopes that it was solicited conversation. It didn't really. So yeah. I'm just going to go back to, we're talking about hospitality marketing. And when we run out of that conversation that day, we're just going to close the room down and say, we were done. We hit what we wanted to today. If it was a 20 minute conversation, it was a 20 minute conversation. If it was 30 minutes, it was 30 minutes. But the uh, the way I was running before was, oh, we're going to be here for at least an hour and we're going to talk about anything hospitality. It didn't do what I wanted it to do, which was, hey, come up with something, you know, what do you want to right. talk about? You know, um, I did speak. So Emily contacted me via um, Instagram. Oh, yeah well and she asked me like hey what's happening and i'm like i don't know <laughs> but it, it, um yeah. the one thing that uh, we both agreed on is when we look at top we look at topics like what's the topic going to be mm -hmm. today and then mm -hmm. we decide whether we're going to bell it right and get put that on our calendar yep. and then come and listen so i I'm not sure if you're thinking about that, but you're it's right amazing. up the lane. Yeah, that's exactly one of the changes, too, is that rather than just saying all things hospitality, which I was doing again, yeah. you know, doing catch all. It's like we're going to talk about this now. I'm going to take the adoption of what we're doing with the show here, which I do a precursor topic like the one for today was are we going backwards, um, which is really a discussion about you know current impact on our industry and so forth. I want to be more specific than that, even when it comes to Clubhouse because of the frequency of the Clubhouse of just saying we're going to talk about. Google My Business. We can just literally take what we talked about today for those that may have missed the show today and throw it into conversation on Monday saying, we're, this is what we came out of our conversation on Friday. We think it's worthy of a discussion on Monday. And, yeah, and I agree with that. Out. And you can even go at, like grittier, I guess, in the sense mm -hmm. of let's just talk about photos. Let's talk about reviews on Google My Business. Let's talk mm -hmm. about like, what you just said, the whole idea of ways and how that works in. Mm -hmm. And it just changes, you know. Um, mm -hmm. No, I completely agree with you. And you know, I looked at it, I was trying to uh, do the empty vessel thing. I thought that if I could create the catalyst of doing it, then others would say, hey, you know what? I want to do Thursday. Or I want to do Wednesday. I want to do Tuesday. Uh, and, and that they had its moments where it did do that, you know, it, based on popularity of the platform and so forth. Uh, but I think people right now, one is vacations and travel. And there was a lot of dilution of uh, attendance because people didn't need the distraction of Clubhouse or have the time for Clubhouse because they were doing stuff. Uh, and then the other was just, and for me in particular, was just the fatigue of conversation. It got yeah. to be like, you know what, I'm rolling around the same stuff or feeling like I need to carry the load of the conversation. And that's not what I'm there for. I was there to be a part of a conversation. So 
Um, I, I'm more than happy to go back. Ed, it just out of coincidence, Ed and I came to the same point at the same time, where it was right. like, because uh, Ed was doing pretty strong with the CVBs and the TDC conversations in the morning. And I'm just not an 8 a.m. guy. And if, if I am up that early, I'm not in any way conversational. <laughs> yeah, you know, he was always shocked when I popped up. He's like, it's yeah. 5.30. What are you doing? I'm, like, no, I'm in Toronto. It's okay. I can uh, chat. Are you still in Toronto right now? Are you still there? Yeah. Oh, Alan, Alan's up there too. Alan is an old friend of my old college. Uh, co co hey, Alan. Buddy. Uh, <laughs> Alan's brilliant. Uh, if you want to meet somebody that is just absolutely talented as the day is long, uh, with sales, I mean, he, uh, Alan, I'll tell you a little, a little story about Alan, real funny. So we, uh, we were both working at a hotel in Florida and he was director of sales and he was in, inviting a, um, uh, a Canadian contingency down for, I forget, whatever it was, whatever. So guess who shows up at the international, Melbourne International Airport dressed as a Mountie to welcome <laughs> our boy, Alan. <laughs> oh, that's and he was funny. a priest. <laughs> that's awesome oh yeah so he he is that's why i was asking him to come into the sale and oh you know steph honestly so a couple of things uh we're going to start potentially varying up the revenue management podcast with different guest hosts but the sales podcast also it was already in the process of changing your glory days yeah that was just the early glory days um the uh the sales podcast we're going to start rotating through on guest hosts as well and that and being host mean here's your show you decide what you want to put on it, who you want to have come with you on it, so forth. We'll just introduce now coming in as such and such. Um, so you're more than welcome to consider if you, if you yourself want to do it or if you know people that are immensely talented. The whole purpose of the podcast, because it has a great audience and it's been going for quite a while, is that we are always wanting to be sales focused or in the case of revenue management, when we start diversifying that one, revenue focused, you know, revenue management. So, uh, and then a marketing one, you're always more than welcome if you want to come in and do that. That's always, that. that's the one I do. I just tend to blurp it out in 20 minutes and 30 minutes. So I'm, I'm looking at saying, well, maybe I want to start varying that one up a little bit. People might be tired of listening to me. Yeah, <laughs> oh, that would be wonderful. Um, I always look, I, I feel like I'm the baby in uh, the hospitality marketing area since I've only come into um, the hospitality industry, what, three years ago now. And there's so much to learn. Um, and it's just, you know, it's a little different than mm. coming from some different industries, but I bring the other industries over into the hotel world. And I'm always thinking, why don't you guys use this? <laughs> like I'm always, right? cause right? it's not the way we do it. And I'm like, but why? Like what? It's true. I, 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 sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Like I've said before, when I used to hire, when I ran hotels, I love to hire people that never worked in hotels because they saw our business the way the guests saw the business, which is why isn't somebody behind the front desk? Meanwhile, I'm tainted with knowing operations by, oh, a shift change or this, or whatever the excuse is. That's not the answer to the problem, which is as a guest walking in, there's nobody there at the front desk to greet them. You know, that's the end yeah. of the problem with this. And you're approaching it the same way from a marketing perspective. It's like, well, we never do that. And I always get frustrated with clients that say, well, we tried that. When did you try that? Well, I don't remember when, but we tried it. Well, then is not now, and now is different than then. So maybe it's a good idea that just didn't have the right timing to it. But just saying we're not even going to consider it because we had already tried it is literally being ignorant to the opportunity that it could have been. You thought it worthy enough to try back then. Why don't we break it back down now and see if it's still worthy of consideration? These simple questions are what most people don't do because they, they don't want to be held culpable on a decision where didn't you try that before and it failed before? What made you think it was going to try it again? Because we thought it was different. Okay. You know, you only learn by losing, you know? So anyway. Definitely. <sighs> and things change all the time. And yeah. I think a lot of times people go with their gut, depending mm -hmm. on their industry, and they're not looking at data. And then mm -hmm. when you actually bring the data, because I always hear, oh, we have so many return guests. It's the return guests. They come back every summer. And then I look at the data and I go, yeah, that's 10%. What are you talking mm. about? Right? But they don't they, don't they made they that. made a statement and they ignore everything other than what validates their statement. I believe this. Therefore, this piece of little information that's way smaller than the actual facts of everything else is my validation for why I say this to be the case. Because they talked to three people in a lobby that came back from the previous year, they feel the majority of our people in the hotel are from people from before. That's just that. What, what there's a term for biased, objective, biased. Uh, there's, yeah. there's a 
Because some, yeah, but you're absolutely right. And I would never, I would actually applaud the fact that you look at it that being new to about three years, that you have a clarity to how things are should be done differently than oh, oh, Mr. Old Crotch the Allen up there, who, you know, been doing it since dirt. You know, he's the first person to overbook Bethlehem, by the way, just so you know, that's how old he is. <laughs> <laughs> and he never lived that down as the front desk agent in Bethlehem that he overbooked the, the place. But anyway, um, so the the ideas should always be reconsidered and, and shot at of like, OK, so if we're going to try this, what's really the risk factor, blah, blah, blah. They don't like doing it. They just want to be nobody wins all the time. If anything, and I got to say this just out of the, what's going on currently. Uh, the, if you talk to people about what's happening in the Olympics with, with, uh, with uh, the gymnastics, you have people that are very critical that are like, well, why can't she just do what she was doing? Why can't she do it for the team? And it's like, one, not safe. Okay. So whatever your excuse is, that's not going. And the second is you have no idea the perspective of where she is at. We really, we put her on this pedestal of being the Olympics that Simone Biles is the, you know, that she's going to win everything. They probably did so much footage of her, for the sh for the Olympics that they were going to feed that happy like they're scrambling to find other videos to do now, but the reality of her to be able to stand up and say, "Look, physically, I wish they call it the twisties." I have no idea what that is, having never had the athletic aptitude to even do near what the, she does. But if you're telling me that um, you could hurt, she could hurt herself because she loses perspective of where the ground is versus what she's doing. I would not want her to do that either. I did, did that that whole process, but to come out of it and say we don't really we 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 the perspective of of capabilities isn't inherent upon winning all the time. It's about knowing when you can and can't do what you are able to do. And a lot of companies don't do that. They to them unless you're batting a thousand, you're not playing right. And it's like no, it's a matter of averages. There's times where you make mistakes and you learn from them, but yeah. The fact that you always win, no, that's that's unrealistic. And and to think that people need to is just weird. So, yeah. Well, I, I kind of said this. Um, somebody did challenge me on like, um, well, you know, she let her team down is what somebody said. And I was like, hang on a second. If she would have done the vault, just she let's just say normal, like everything was normal. And she did her vault and she hurt her ankle or it, like she landed. And then she was like, mm, my ankle doesn't feel right. And they went to the medical tent, so to speak, and they said, you know what, we want you to stay off your ankle for the next four days. Otherwise, you may never walk again or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Everybody would be like, oh, she hurt her ankle. OK, right. that's fine. Right. I, we understand she can't compete. But because it's a mental health issue, mm -hmm. um, that's not considered uh, part part of you and your body. And that's where I have a real hard time. She didn't let her team down. She actually did them a favor because she, if she would have competed, she would have gotten horrible scores, like right. not what they were expecting. And then she really would have let them down, right? Yeah. So I, I think that people don't really consider mental health as um, part of the body. And it's funny because, you know, I, the first thing I saw when all this was happening, and this is one of the guy jock movies of all time is Top Gun. I mean, it's like Roadhouse. It's these movies that guys are like, yeah, that's man's movie, you know, that whatever it is. And in, in it is a pivotal moment where, you know, at the very beginning of the, of the movie, the other pilot gets spooked from the other fighter pilots and he loses his ability to do what he used to do. And at the end, he throws in his wings and says, I can't do this anymore. That's fine. Oh, that's a yay. Woo. You know, that's a guy thing. You know, woo. I lost my edge. I can't do this anymore. You know, whatever it is. But we don't offer that in the reality of what we're expecting, you know, our expectations of people. It's like we, we in the politics of companies, you walk into a, bo a boardroom with your peers, departmental peers, and you know, we equate it to shark tanks, you know, blood in the water. Failure is blood in the water. Uh, right. Not meeting a goal is a failure in the water. And you, you lose merit based on your failures. I'm not taking away the fact that you can't keep rewarding somebody who does not perform at the levels you're asking them to do. I'm not being naive in that statement. I am being very realistic in the statement that you can't truly succeed in improving what you're doing by winning all the time. Because 
what you win, and this is this is an argument I'm going to expand on just as I say, by winning, you feel that you achieved the ultimate success. What you did do was go above a bar that was not failure because, and this is an argument I have with ownerships all the time, is they do not understand unrealized revenue. They do not equate the math associated with the money that they should have gotten based on decisions that they didn't do. That that they see it that, well, we made more running. We got a four to one ratio. Yeah, but you could have get a 10 to one ratio had you done something different. You know, the very metrics that you're holding yourself to, you say you were successful by doing this, but in fact, you were you didn't make all the right decisions to get even a higher level, that unrealized revenue that you didn't hit. So you're saying you're a winner when really you're just mediocre. And that doesn't teach you anything. It's almost better for you to have lost and had to stop the campaign because it wasn't succeeding and reevaluate it and realize what you needed to do to get the 10 to one return than it was to feel successful by getting the four to one return. And it's a concept that a lot of companies in, 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 in the, the C-level don't quite understand. You know, and this goes to what you're talking about. It's like we should invest uh, ten thousand dollars in a new website. Well, you know what? You well, know, the realization is that we can make a lot more money with our website. Yeah, but you know, it's only going to last two years. Blah blah blah. The website's okay right now, and they accept the mediocrity of performance now as a success for the un for the lack of having to have the expense of doing something new, and they forget the unrealized revenue of what that new site could have produced. That same decision process just happened through the COVID pandemic in the first year. Well, we should redo all these things, but you know what? <laughs> Let's not spend the money because we don't know what's going to happen. So we're not going to. And now they didn't invest in training. They didn't invest in their tech stack. They didn't invest in their ability to basically take the race car off of the track during a caution flag and rebuild the engine, which would not have been available prior to the, you know, them being pulled off the track. And now they're putting an old car back on the track again. And it's failing and they're wondering, well, what's well, you know, it's like because you didn't take the opportunity to improve your tech stack or your campaign structure or whatever. You didn't invest in it. You let everybody go. And now you're asking them to come back and you're giving them the old bust them up car to go around the track. And the other people that did do that stuff are kicking your butt in the race because they did put a new car in and they are kicking your butt. That's the part that people in businesses don't seem to get a sense of. Oh, wait, wait, Alan said, oh, maybe we're going to the Yeah, yep. mental health, yeah, yeah. Data support, come to focus mental health. It is, it is, it is interesting how mental health is going. I, I think in a lot of ways, this whole uh, event is going to hopefully have at least a short-term impact on people's perceptions of what's needed to make proper decisions. Uh, and to your point, as you said, it wasn't that she really hurt her ankle physically. I think everybody was waiting for, the doctor's gonna tell us she can't play because she hurt her back or her foot or her leg or something. Wait a minute, no, she's choosing not to do this? And now that really baffled people. Like, how can you do all the things you've done in your life to get to this point and then step off to the side because you don't feel that you can? For those people, it's like, really? Um, that's amazing that you would consider that as a, as a problem. You know, that's being probably the most professional I can think of anybody that says, I can't do what you're asking me to do right now. It's going to hurt us, hurt me. It's not even a selfish act that she would hurt herself. That in itself is justification. The fact that she would hurt the very purpose of why everybody else on her team is there. As you said, you know, even if she performed at a mediocre level or if at all or did badly, it hurt everybody else. At least this gave everybody else a chance to do good. Yeah. And, you know, like if you, because then they'd all feel bad, right? Mm -hmm. Like she's not performing her best kind of thing. Why? What's going on? And then they all, they all start doubting them themselves. And yeah, I, you know, you and have you to do what's what, right for you. And, and, and the all around winning person, I, I just love the fact that she wasn't, I love all the people that predicated what they thought was going to happen. And they did all the videos of some, some vials and, and all the, the things that they were just anticipating. And that guy's just thrown out and they're like, Oh my gosh, what do we have on her? <laughs> you know, and they, they, you know, it's like they had some, maybe some byline story stuff and you know, whatever have you. And they had to scramble to get content up. I, I normally, you know, from my part of being video, video and production and so forth, I'd be like, ah, what am I going to do? You know, but in, um, from a spectator point of view, I'm like, ha, see, <laughs> you know, just never underestimate the underdogs and never underestimate the possibility that whatever you anticipate is not going to ha be what happens. And that's 
case in point with this. Who would have ever thought going to these Olympics where are we are right now for this stuff? And that goes to all the other stuff too, where they 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 glorified uh, oh well US is gonna dom U US has always dominated this. They do this. I know for ratings and all this other stuff, and there's a problem of, of you know, not having attendance there and all this other stuff, but, you know, they do all these hype. And then when the people get a silver, it's like a letdown. I'm like, you're missing the point of this, aren't you? I mean, first off, being at the Olympics isn't just a, I think I'll go to the Olympics this year. You have to be at such a level to even qualify to go to these things. And to attain that level and then to actually get a medal and achievement to everybody else you competed with. And you're thinking that you were let down because they didn't do what you thought they were going to do. Wow. <laughs> well, you know, I grew up in Canada, so we have a much different perspective than oh, really? the Americans. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we uh, I've always watched both channels, uh, whoever had, you know, the American channel and the Canadian channel. And the perspective has always been very different. And when, because, you know, when we watch the Olympics in Canada, we see everyone in the world and we yes. see lots of things people are competing in. In the United States, I found we're only watching the programming where the United States dominates. Yes. Yes. Although I got to say. Miss you miss out on all these say, other great sports and all these other amazing athletes and these stories. I kind of feel like this year, and maybe I haven't really watched as much as I have in the past, but I'm not hearing the stories. And that's what really makes the Olympics so great. Mm -hmm. And I wish all sport could be like that all year, where mm -hmm. you hear about this person who grew up as a little child who was like, oh, I wish one day I could do X. And they actually, you know, they talk about their history and how they got to the Olympics and their things they had to overcome. And that makes it exciting, right? Because you learn about the person. Because mm -hmm. really, I can watch somebody swim 100 meters of a pool and it's really not that entertaining. Let's be mm. real. <laughs> you know, like, Although I got to tell you, though, watching the swimming, you see yesterday? them dive off. First off, they're diving longer and farther than probably the length of my entire freaking pool that I have access to at the condo is. Right. And then secondly, they're underwater longer than probably twice the length of the pool that I have. And I'm sitting there going, and they're going it really fast. And you just, you, 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 from the perspective of seeing it, you're, you forget in awe the reality of what they're doing is amazing. You know, um, but you're to your point. Now, I will say, I, and this is just the geek in me. So I have the VR goggle, has the Oculus headsets, and Xfinity has offered a VR experience to watch the Olympics. Well, they're kind of, I wouldn't say the redheaded stepchild in the coverage, but they're certainly not the NBC or the Olympic uh, uh, network that runs it. Um, so they're led into a lot of venues that, yes, there's some popular ones, which is fun, but there are also a lot of secondary ones like badminton and ping pong and stuff, which are really, really neat to watch. But in VR, it is a really weird experience to be sitting right next to the pool and or right next to uh, the ping pong table or right next to the volleyball court, as if you're sitting in the stands, looking around, the stands are behind you, everything's there, and you're there visually. And then you're like, this is cool. I mean, so you, you, there is a little diversity to it, but yeah, you're right. And, 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 I do feel bad because I understand the other side of it. NBC spent billions, millions, hundreds of millions or whatever on being able to have the uh, the coverage of the, the the Olympics. And it is a financial fiasco. And I think that Los Angeles in 2028 will be the last way we see the Olympics this way. I just honestly believe that it can't exist the way they keep doing it, you know. Uh, and I think it's going to turn into something different, either a permanent venue or multiplicities of venues globally because the purpose of it all, and I know we're not even a hospitality market, but marketing, let's talk about marketing in general. So there's a huge investment from NBC to cover this. They have all the tiered down based on the channels that they control, CSB and, and, this, and NBC, SN, SN uh, USA. They offer all these different places that you watch this stuff. But to your point, they got the coverage, but they didn't invest in so much the non-hyped people. The ones that were, oh, they're going to get gold and they did the story backgrounds and everything else. They just are covering the stuff. And because of the way it isn't going the way they planned, you see them scrambling to get other things of interest. The stories that they didn't pursue that now we need something, you know. Uh, and so they're chasing down, you know, the, the fencing person that was not expected to even get into the metal contention and she gets a gold. They had no story on her, you know, <laughs> and, and it's like, well, how'd that feel? You know, and so now all of a sudden they're trying to 
build the story. You can tell the fact that they literally just made this footage up. I mean, not made it up as in fictitious, but grabbed it now because now she's a she's done something that's never been done in fencing. And that's the stories that are amazing is that, you know, these things happen. Uh, and, and you watch uh, the other, other athletes that never were supposed to even medal and they wouldn't go medal. And you're just, you're just happy as heck. You know, you yeah. know that that is just something that, you know, for the country that they represent, for their families that did all the things that made them a success to, to be able to get to that point, and for them doing what they did to get there. And I don't care what flag's over their head. They did it, right. you know? Yeah. Oh, well, yes. And we digress. We're and we about. digress. But anyway, all right. So, Alan, you and I are going to talk about sales market podcasts and you hosting on that stuff. Steph, you're going to think about the same thing and other variations thereof. Uh, we're going to do Clubhouse again next week, Monday, Wednesdays. Great. I'll uh, let Emily know. Yeah, and I, I, right now we'll just say Mondays is going to be specifically about uh, Google My Business, AK okay. Photos. All right, let's just awesome. do it. Yeah, let's yeah. do that. Love um, it. You know, people don't really all know what you. So, Steph, what, you, what do you do? Where, where can people find you? What do they? What, what do you know? The hotels you represent, and all this other stuff. To tell them about well, what you do. Um, I work for a hotel group in San Diego, California. We have three properties: the uh, Lodge at Torrey Pines, which, which most people are familiar with because of the U.S. Open. The Bahia Resort Hotel, which is iconic. It was built in 1953 on Mission Bay. And that's what started Mission Bay being what it is today. And then we have the Catamaran Resort Hotel and Spa as well. And I'm a digital marketer for the group. And I love um, talking to other people to learn from them and to share what I have learned. And you can find me on LinkedIn, Stephanie uh, Mayo. And it's uh, S-T-E-F, like fitness, A-N-I-E. And Mayo is M-A-I-O. And no. might I add, if you want to know anything about hiking, oh, yeah. <laughs> outdoor sports, what to do when you're on a paddleboard or anything like that, she's your girl. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Love talking about those things. And I like to pe get people outside having fun safely. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I see your posts now because we're friends, obviously. And the things that you do and the distances you go and the th and like. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. So yes. Um, thank you everyone. Alan, great to see you in the room. Thanks for talking. Um, everybody else that came in and came out and all this other fun stuff. Uh, you can find us of course, obviously at hospitality, uh, channel TV, uh, to replay all this and all the previous episodes. There's also a longer archive that's at hospitality digital marketing forward slash live. Um, that's where the transcripts and, and so forth. We do translate this in 11 languages. We simulcast this again back Wednesday, 1130 AM Sydney and UK time, London time. So we get the time zones for those that may have missed us. Um, and also it's a live broadcast on your Roku, Google Play, Apple TV, and what am I missing? Amazon Prime and Google Play, Apple TV, Roku, Apple Twitter. TV. I forget. But anyway, we're everywhere. I mean, we're even on your PlayStation for that matter. Uh, and you can do it on your apps and phones and Google and all that stuff. So uh, we're there. And if you want to see that, you can also go to just talktravel.tv. Uh, that's the web presence of everything else that's on the TV channel. So with that in mind, Steph, thanks for jumping in with us today. It was thanks. a wrap. It was pleasure great to see you. See you. Yeah. Sorry, I haven't talked to you in the past couple of weeks, but it's just me being busy and that being quiet. Yeah. So. Yeah, awesome. we'll, get back to it. we'll get back to it next week. And uh, we'll see everybody next week, 11.30 a.m. Eastern Friday for show number 313. And we'll pick another happy topic by them for, for that show. So thank you, everybody. Thanks, Steph. We'll talk to everybody Bye. soon. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. You too.